of time uh, to, to kind of let people settled. Um, this is Soccer Recruiting 101. Um, if you're having issues or, or ultimately if you, you, you know, through on this session and you'd like to get a bit of a review in terms of what we talk about here today, what we discuss on different concepts that we go over, um, I will be sending out a recording of this class to everybody who's registered. So feel free to ultimately review the recording at any point. Um, you know, I, I like to at least kind of tell a lot of my athletes that I'm assigned uh, as their head recruiting coach or, or HRC as we like to call it here in the office. Um, that make sure we pay attention and, and, and we can absorb the knowledge that, you know, we learn here in the class today. Um, I know it's easy for you guys to register with these classes because, you know, your HRC at NCSA tells you to register and, and um, you know, feel like we already know a lot of the concepts at this point, but, you know, un unless we can absorb any knowledge that we, uh, that we pick up or, or understand or any concepts that we talk about really in any of these classes, not just soccer recruiting 101, but, uh, and can't apply it or forget about it over a period of time and then don't know how it necessarily affects us and our recruitment, then there's not much good, you know, that, that, that we can kind of get out of it. So try to pay attention to Take notes. Um, I will be sending out the recording so you can review it, as I mentioned. And then I will be leaving some time allotted near the end for everybody to ask questions and engage with um, you know, any, any, any thoughts, concerns, feedback, um, mainly questions in regards to whatever we talk about here in the class today. Um, for those of you who um, are any of my assigned athletes that I've already spoken to, you guys probably already know that I do tend to be a little bit of a chatterbox. Um, so we'll try to keep this session um, anywhere in between 30, 45 minutes. Um, but uh, you never know, I could get going. <laughs> so. Um, for those of you who don't know me. But nonetheless, what we're going to talk about here today is mainly just building the foundation of your recruitment. Many of you that are in on this class here today are new members to TSA. Um, it's, it's it's one thing that you guys have, you know, a, a profile that you can kind of utilize tools to connect with college coaches with right now, but it's another to know how the tools that we can utilize through our NCSA profile apply to recruitment. It's hard to know how to apply those tools to recruitment if we don't know what the, the division levels are, if we don't know what the timeline looks like, if we don't know what recruiting even means. So hopefully after this session, everybody here, especially new members to NCSA who are going through this process for the first time, um, we'll have a much better understanding of just what being a recruited athlete means, what the division levels are, um, what the recruiting timeline looks like for our own individual selves and where we're currently at within the entire recruiting timeline, and then what next steps are, um, you know, here in CSA and with, you know, you guys just engaging as athletes within the uh, within the process itself. So without further ado, we'll get started, and I do want to begin talking a little bit about myself so you guys are comfortable with where I'm coming from. I am a former Division One soccer player myself, so I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, from the Cleveland area. Um, I tend to work with all of our uh, men's players here in the office, but do ultimately run a lot of uh, uh, these types of sessions that deal with both men's and women's recruiting. And there are differences to both, so make sure we pay attention in terms of just what we're referring to when we're going through this process and hopefully the slide or this class and hopefully the slides will help. Um, but I ultimately uh, am a former Division One player from Northeast Ohio. I actually played college uh, college soccer at Wright State University down in Dayton, Ohio. Um, it's a it's a, a, a program in the Horizon League. Um, you know, we we had some success when I was there. Ultimately, in, in, in playing, I was actually a Greg and Drulis Award winner, which is just sort of an individual award given out by the team each year uh, in 2013. Um, for those of you asking, I and and wondering, I am 26. I graduated in 2014. Uh, been involved in in, in soccer um, for really 19 years of my life, 19, 20 years probably at this point of my life, um, at high levels, at competitive levels, and have been involved in the recruiting side and with NCSA for three years. Um, so we're Horizon League finalists back in 2011, um, so experienced some success when I was there at the college level. Primarily, I was an outside midfielder and outside back, but you'd be hard-pressed to find any position that I haven't played at some point throughout most of my career. 
Um, I came up through an academy system, so um, the academy system, I should say, the USSDA. Um, some of you may be familiar with what the USSDA is, others may not. Um, it's just a high level of club soccer. Um, sir, can you not hear me? It sounds like it looks like somebody was having some audio issues. Um, if you guys can't hear me or if the audio ultimately cuts out, go ahead and uh, just type in the chat box and let me know and, and, and at least bring it to my attention. Um, nonetheless, um, I came up through the academy system. This was like the inaugural season of the USSDA system, back when you could still play at a high school level and back when you could still ultimately play at a collegiate level or, or at, a, um, at a club level. Um, long story short, high level of club for those who aren't familiar with it. I am a first team All-Ohio selection when I was at the high school level, two-time first team All-Region, county, and league as well. And then as a member of the academy system, I was a member of, of the um, Ohio North ODP and the U.S. Youth National Pool as a member of the academy system. So played at high levels, played against guys who are currently in the MLS and have gone on to do good things. Um, um, your question, yes, you can ask questions um, by typing in the chat box on the bottom right. Um, you guys are all muted in the classroom now. So if you have a question, go ahead and just type it in the bottom right. Um, Postgraduate, after I graduated from Wright State University, I went on to play a year of semi-professional soccer with a team called AFC Cleveland. Um, for those of you who are baseball fans, um, kind of like the equivalent of single-A baseball. I did that for a year and quickly kind of realized that not the best ways to make money. Right? So I went on to um, end my career as a player and went on to continue my career in recruiting and as a coach. I, I coached a youth club up in Northeast Ohio called AK. Um, I was a guest coach with them mainly um, while I was also working um, with, with – uh, the MLS program, uh, the Columbus Crews, if you guys may be familiar with them. I was a member of their front office and interned with them. Um, and then uh, ultimately, when it comes to my experience and questions with college coaches, um, I have actually have right now over 15-plus former teammates that I've played with throughout club, high school soccer, collegiate soccer, coaching at a college level, and uh, – countless other coaches that I've met throughout the years in terms of being a youth player, in terms of being a collegiate player, um, you know, that, that many of our soccer specialists have or, or soccer recruiting coaches have here at NCSA to help assist you guys, depending on your membership, um, with team with coaches. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, we'll, we'll move on because I know this is, uh, you know, a class devoted to kind of talking about your processes, and I don't want to spend too, time, too much time there. wanted to make sure you guys know where I'm coming from. I do approach this process more so from the perspective of a player. Um, so, you know, I tend to think I can kind of sympathize with families and situations that they go through. Um, so in terms of just process-oriented and um, kind of schedule-oriented concepts to recruiting, you know, I'm going to be your go-to guy. So, so you know, obviously, you know, field, uh, you know, distribute any questions near the end of this session. Um, long story short, today we're going to be talking about divisions and scholarships mainly. That's going to be really the um, primary um, – sort of, of grouping of topics that we discuss here today. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the divisions. Um, I know that can be a, 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 you know, somewhat of a, a, a point of confusion for some families. Um, and before we can connect with coaches and be proactive and email and send video, talk to coaches and do all those good things that we'd like to experience throughout the recruiting process, you guys need to know who you're talking to and, and what each of those division levels are able to provide as benefits, maybe as some negatives with some certain division levels, um, but ultimately picking up an understanding of just what the divisions provide and what the, the pros and cons are of each um, is going to be a really good starting point for you guys to be able to identify schools that you want to target later on down the line. Um, we'll discuss the overall soccer recruiting timeline for both men's and women's soccer. Um, we'll also discuss next steps for you, new members of NCSA, and then uh, field any questions here um, towards the end of the call, like I mentioned uh, a couple times. Okay. So we'll get into it. The division levels themselves are really broken down into, I mean, five main categories, and then we just go ahead and throw the other 
sort of category in there. Um, you may run into some situations where schools aren't specifically designated as having a specific division. There's some um, schools in Pennsylvania that are basically um, members of like the Penn State sort of satellite system that don't necessarily compete in a specific division. They're in their own division. And then there's some other examples throughout the, the you know the, the Korean in different situations. But nonetheless, the primary division levels overall are going to be Division One, Division Two, NAIA, and um, Division Three um, programs. And then all the, obviously we have our junior colleges rounding it out, um, and, and we'll make sure we discuss all of these um, in depth. Those are really the primary five that we need to consider when, when going through this process. Start with Division One. Division One is the one that the most people know about. Okay, Division One is a lot of times goals for any athletes that want to compete collegiately, and we'll talk a little bit about um, you know how some other opportunities at other division levels could be very closely related to that of opportunities at Division One. But um, from here, you know, we, we see that in terms of teams that compete under the Division I soccer umbrella um, or the NCAA Division I soccer umbrella. Uh, on the men's side, there's 206 programs in total nationwide, which really only makes up maybe – you know, 15, 20 percent of the only of the overall programs, um, you know, for collegiate soccer in the United States. Um, yes, um, yeah, 20, 15, 20 percent. I'm trying to do the math in my head here. Um, but nonetheless, not a lot of opportunities. This is actually the second least amount of opportunities um, that you can play at a college level um, in terms of division for the men's side. Many more opportunities on the women's side to compete and play Division I. Um, you know, there's programs and, or conferences like the SEC, which is down the southeast, um, you know, the, the, the Big 12. Um, these are all predominantly women's collegiate soccer conferences. Um, no men's teams in the SEC really participate in men's soccer other than like a school like Kentucky, and they're not, they, they compete in a different conference at that point. But nonetheless, um, there's a better opportunity for you as a women's player to go Division One than from a men's perspective. Um, you know, these, these, these schools are really recruiting the elite of the elite, the top players across the United States and outside of the country, which is something that you guys need to consider and need to really begin conceptualizing. You're not only competing against, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of potential college recruits across the United States, um, but hundreds and thousands of kids worldwide who want to ultimately attend school here in the United States um, to play at a, 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 a level that, that has essentially limited availability. Um, well, the, the recruiting here is very competitive. The timelines of these programs tend to be very accelerated. Um, a lot of these programs recruit from higher levels of competitive club soccer um, and very specific levels of competitive club soccer. So that's what makes the recruiting here so competitive as a whole from a coach's perspective is that um, – you know, these are always the most desirable opportunities for players. They can have their pick of the litter. Um, you know, just because we have interest in potentially uh, attending a Division One program doesn't necessarily mean that we will be recruited by a Division One program. It's going to be predicated on your ability to build a relationship with a coach at this level and get noticed mainly. So if we're not playing club soccer and not playing on a travel circuit in tournaments and showcases where there's Division One coaches present, your opportunities of getting scouted, seen, noticed, recruited, and offered a scholarship from a Division I university um, is extremely slim. Okay. Um, I do want to point out the scholarship availability at the Division I level. On the men's side, they are able to provide 9.9 .9 full athletic scholarships to their entire roster of probably 20 to 25 kids, maybe more than that, 25 to 30 in some situations. Um, Per year, okay. So any of you coming into this process and 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 wanting to go to a Division One program, and more importantly, wanting to get a full ride scholarship, which is something that we hear a lot from people, um, we want to start to curtail some of those expectations now. You know, if we do math, 25 to 30 kids maybe on a roster at one time, 
10 athletic scholarships, not even 10 athletic scholarships to split up amongst all those kids. Um, it is it's very rare that you are going to receive a full athletic scholarship to compete at a Division One level. Um, they do offer partial scholarships. They do offer half scholarships. Oftentimes what they will do is allocate, you know, maybe – a quarter of a scholarship, a half of a scholarship um, to a multitude of different players on their roster. Some may not be under any athletic scholarship at all. You know, these are essentially titled recruited walk-on players to some of these Division One programs um, where they're recruited, but they're just not offered any athletic money. Um, long story short, why I bring this up is um, I want expectations to be in line. If you're going through this process and we're talking to coaches and we expect to get to the end of this process, regardless of how good you are, and expect to receive a full ride athletic scholarship, you know we, we're not necessarily um, we're necessarily in the right mindset in terms of the, the 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 focus that needs to be put into the classroom to offset some of the cost of that with academic money. Um, you know, the work that needs to be put in um, to apply for scholarships as we get older in high school, social scholarships or local scholarships to offset some of the cost of college. Um, you know, everybody will get probably a little bit of something if you're recruited to a Division One program. Um, brides on the men's side are rare. Women's do offer – Teen full athletic scholarships to their rosters of, of 25 to 30, 20, 25, again, somewhere it's in that range. So getting a full ride athletic scholarship on the women's side is more likely than on the men's. It does happen. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some changes that were made with the NCAA rules and regulations as we get a little bit later on in this, in, in this slide. Um, but nonetheless, um, kind of recruiting, you know, making sure that you can ultimately play in front of these coaches and play on travel and club circuit, um, limited availability to these levels, um, limited opportunities, especially for men's at a Division One level, um, recruiting both internationally and domestically here within the United States with limited scholarship availability, specifically on the men's side, more availability on the women's. Um, would essentially the, the processes of accepting a Division One offer would come in the form of a verbal offer and a verbal acceptance that happens, you know, the men's side somewhere between um, this spring of junior year through to you know early fall of senior year. That's really when those verbal offers are extended by Division One programs on the men's side. The women's I'll talk about that here in a little bit because some things have changed. Um, but nonetheless, um, on the men's side, that's normally when you would make that verbal commitment. And then National Signing Day, where you would actually sign your national letter of intent on the dotted line for both men's and women's, is in early February every year of senior year. So you, the process would go where you would accept a verbal offer and then ultimately sign on the dotted line, formally accept that offer early February of senior year and, 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 and pen that into place. Um, I talked a little bit or I touched on new NCAA, NCAA regulations that were just put into place for Division I schools on both the men's and women's earlier in the call. And this is something that I really want to make sure that, that I make abundantly clear with everybody here today. Um, literally about four weeks ago, I think, or maybe five, I mean, we may be looking at like a month and a half at this point, but nonetheless, the NCAA just came through with new um, – rules and regulations in place for Division I college recruiting on the men's and women's soccer side and for Division I college programs only. Um, it used to be, and this may be what some of you guys are under the impression of here now, it used to be where um, you as an athlete, as an underclassman, specifically freshmen and sophomores, Okay, could reach out to whoever you wanted on a Division One soccer side, send an email, call a college coach, and 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 basically connect with those coaches in that way. Um, where you were prohibited at classmen as freshmen and sophomores is how a college coach at a Division One level would be able to respond to you as um, somebody who's reaching out to them via email um, in a recruiting sense or just by sending like a basic camp invite or a questionnaire. Um, 
sort of, of request. That is still the rule. You still, as freshman, sophomore players, can reach out to whoever you want, any Division One coaches that you want via email. Okay, but you guys need to be under the expectation that those coaches are not going to be able to respond in ways other than visa camp invitations or questionnaire requests until September 1st going into your junior season or junior year. Okay, there's still things that freshmen and sophomores can be doing to connect with Division One coaches and to get on a college coach's radar at a Division One level, but you are still able to reach out to whoever you want via email, send footage to whoever you want. Um, that changed. Now, what the rules also used to be is that as a freshman and a sophomore attending a, a Division I college ID camp as a freshman sophomore, you could communicate with coaches in a recruiting sense as long as you were on campus at an ID camp. You were also permitted to be able to take unofficial visits, basically set up a tour of campus through the admissions department, swing by the coach's office, knock on the door, and talk to a Division I coach as a freshman or sophomore. That has now, with the new NCAA rules and regulations, been completely eliminated. Okay, You are no longer able to attend a college ID camp as a freshman, sophomore, to one school, and talk to a Division I college coach in any way other than tangible coaching. They're not allowed to talk to you about recruiting at all. They're not allowed to give you feedback as a potential recruit. And the same goes if you guys were to take tours of campuses, which some of you may be setting up this summer. Do not go to those tours or do not you know, around campus under the impression that you'll just be able to swing by a coach's office, knock on the door, and talk to them in a recruiting sense. That has been eliminated by the NCAA. So as a way to sort of view as a family more time. Um, recruiting, especially on the women's soccer side, started to get a little bit out of hand where many of of uh, you know women's soccer players were committing to Division One schools as freshmen and sophomores. Um, if you're a junior, if you're a 2019 right now, winker player, and you're in on this, and, and you're in on this class, and you had desires to play Division One, most of the opportunities are probably taken up. Now that's not the same case on the men's side. Um, it's things were just a, a bit more accelerated for the women's. Um, so what they've really done is just kind of delayed that timeline, and we are still unsure as to how that's going to affect us. Um, as recruits to Division One programs at this point. Um, I recommend, depending on your membership, that you guys stay in constant communication with your recruiting coach um, in the event that you desire to go Division One and just talk about how the new rules and regulations that are put in place are going to affect you specifically as a recruit, especially with the summer approaching. A lot of you are going to be participating in ID camps. A lot of you are going to be taking potentially some unofficial visits uh, to college campus. Um, just be here. You guys can still reach out to whoever you want via email, attempt to get on a college's radar. Um, they still can't respond in a specific way until September 1st going into junior year. Um, but we are just no longer permitted to talk to coaches in a recruiting sense like we did before um, at a camp or an unofficial visit. So I'm sure I'm going to have some questions about that at the end. Um, feel free to jot those down if, if you uh, want to remember for the end of the call. Um, Vision 2. Um, Vision 2 is a, uh, is, is a level that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with, too, as well. Um, you know, 214 men's programs participate in NCAA Division II soccer. Um, you can see that that's kind of slight, that's slightly more than the Division I programs that are available nationwide from a men's perspective. Um, women's Division II soccer dramatically drops off from Division I to Division II. Um, you know, Division I recruiting is still more competitive. You know, you still need to be able to perform at a Division I level in order to um, ultimately um, achieve a roster spot from a women's perspective. But there's just there's there's less schools that ultimately offer those types. Um, you know, soccer at a college level at a, at a, at a Division II program. Um, we can see that scholarships are dramatically different on the women's side too as well. Roughly similar on the side, but, um, you know, soccer only is allotted nine full scholarships if a program is fully funded at Division II. Um, 
up amongst their roster of still 20, 25, maybe 30 kids. Okay, so so any of you wanting to go Division One that are saying, oh, well, well, I'd be open to Division Two as well. You know, if 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 I'm not a full ride scholarship here at a Division One level, then I'll just go Division Two, and it's still not the case, right? You know, they, they're still able to split up those scholarships split those up amongst their rosters, um, you know, but, but full-ride scholarships at a Division II level are still um, very rare for the men's side and much less prevalent on the women's side. We can see that as opposed to 14 full scholarships at Division I, women's soccer uh, Division II programs are able to offer 9.9. .9. Again, these will be split up amongst their rosters of 20, 25, 30. Now, one thing I really want to take some time to discuss, guys, and, and what is hugely important and some of you who are my assigned athletes who I've already spoken to have probably already heard me talk about this before. I want you guys to be fully aware of, of how much parity there is in college soccer. You know, some of you may not necessarily be familiar with the term parity. What that basically means is there's, there's competitive teams at every division level within the NCAA and the NAIA. Okay, we don't play football play basketball okay these are not measurable driven sports and when i say measurable driven sports i mean in football for any of you guys who are familiar with football let's say you're a foot two um 320 pound offensive tackle in high school um then you're a division one recruit and 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 because you can keep up with the rigors and the and the physicality of a division one football program you know you could be the best off of tackle in the in the United States, but if you're a foot ten, two hundred and 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 fifty pounds, you know you're not going to be able just to keep up with the rigors of a Division One football program. Um, you're probably going to have to go some lower level division, which is ultimately going to contribute to Division One always being better than Division Two, always being better than Division Three, always being better than NAIA in sports like. Football football, in sports like basketball that are measurable driven sports. Soccer is a measurable driven sport. You know, coaches are, are going to look at what your height is. They're going to look at what your weight is. You know, they're going to look at they're, – they're not going to look at statistics like they will in, in basketball and football. They are looking, evaluating you on talent and talent alone. Video is huge. Um, soccer is what we would call a skill-based sport meaning that there's a lot of talented players out, out there and a lot of players who have received good training over their youth careers. Um, and in a situation like football where that may be the case, but they just don't have the size, soccer doesn't matter in both the men's and women's perspective. So there's talented players going to every school in every division level. You know, it's not just that the talented players are going to Division One. Some of them may be deciding that they want to go to a smaller school and end up, um, you know, being very talented players at a Division Three level because it makes the most sense for what they want to get out of a college experience. Um, which basically leads to there being a lot of parity or um, competitive programs across all five of the division levels. Um, four of the four-year programs, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, and NAI, and we'll talk about the benefits of those later on down the line. But, um, you know, one thing that I oftentimes hear from some of my athletes that I talk to when I'm trying to understand their goals in terms of division is that I want to go Division One because I want to play at the most competitive level. Well, that's not the case in, in coach soccer. Um, a, a competitive Division Two, a competitive Division Three school, whole as a team is probably very similar to that of like a, a mid-major, a mid-tier Division One program. Elite Division One programs are in a class of their own. Obviously, they're going to be the elite of the elite. They're going to recruit the best players. They're going to be in, in, in a spot where um, they're recruiting the best players nationwide. Um, but ultimately, if your desire is to play at the most competitive school possible, um, you know, then then I wouldn't, as as individuals, start looking immediately at Division One, thinking that that's where the most competitive programs are, because there's competitive levels, again, at multitude of different division levels. There's a lot of parity in college soccer because it's a skill-based sport. Okay, um, you know, I I will still say that Division One.
program recruiting is still more competitive, right? You still need to be a good player and an elite player to go to a Division One caliber program, um, just because those tend to be the most desirable programs, and supply and demand tells us that, you know, when there's a lot of demand for specific roster opening, um, you know, and then there's going to be a, a you know, short amount of supply on opportunities like that that are going to be given out. Um, so it's still more difficult to get recruited to a Division One or a Division Two versus like a Division Three. But nonetheless, there's already in college soccer. So I wanted to spend some time on that just so everybody was aware. Um, and I'm sure I'll get questions on that towards the end as well. You still make a verbal commitment. Um, and you sign a national letter of intent early February of senior year. Um, the process is the same as Division One, and 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 just how you will commit and how you'll accept an offer at a Division Two school as a Division One. The timeline is a little bit more delayed. Um, so, for example, um, you'll probably make a verbal commitment depending on the program and the men's side to a Division II program at some point in the summer going into your senior year, and then those Division II programs will probably be done recruiting um, by early winter, midwinter of senior year, and that's kind of the period in time then when you would go ahead and sign your national letter of intent. Um, side it's accelerated a little bit, but again, just given how the new NCAA rules and regulations affected women's soccer recruiting, and we're still a little bit just unclear uh, um, from a coach's perspective on how that is going to affect the timeline. So again, communicate regularly with our member support team to get any updates on what we're seeing with the timeline from the women's side. Communicate with your head recruiting coach in the um, depending on your membership. Um, the one beneficial part about Division II programs is that tryouts are pitted on visits to Division II programs. Division I doesn't offer open tryouts, and this is different than that of like a walk-on tryout, guys. It's two different concepts. Um, a tryout at a Division II level is when you are still a high school athlete. Um, oftentimes you may hear Division II or NAIA programs, which we'll talk about um, when when they're recruiting you or when they're targeting you or when they're communicating with you, offering you the opportunity to come and try out and train with their own varsity team, um, that is a very good way to play in front of a coach and get on a college coach's radar. Um, these are by invitation only, so you can't just show up on campus and practice with a Division II squad, but that's something that Division II allows. NAIA allows that. Division One and Division Three doesn't. So if you're struggling to play in front of coaches, look the route of maybe requesting um, open tryouts as you, you know, become a, um, a a senior in in high school. Those are only allowed after the beginning day of classes, senior year at a Division Two level. Um, different division levels are prevalent in different regions. So you know if if you find that you know you're you're having a tough time finding division 2 programs because you want to play at that level up in the Pacific Northwest for example it's because there's not a huge contingency of division 2 schools up in the Pacific Northwest that's when the parity in college soccer comes into play in which you may want to look to a more competitive division 3 program or a more competitive NAIA program, um, and that's the benefits of that. Um, but nonetheless, Division II programs are most prevalent in the Southeast, and in the event that you're in the Southeast, they are scattered all over the place, but the majority of Division II programs are going to be located in the Southeastern region, and because recruiting is very regionalized, um, you know, in order to play at a Division II program, um, you're going to connect with a coach or get seen by a coach um, that is predominantly living in the southeast. Um, so keep that in mind if you're somebody located in other areas of the country. You may not find a huge contingency of those programs nationwide. Our NAI, I know, tends to be the big question, uh, tends to be the big mystery for a lot of student athletes just joining this process or just entering this process. There's an absolutely ton of benefit to going to an NAIA school, guys. Um, NAIA programs, or NAIA in itself, it stands for National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics. Everybody here is familiar with the NCAA. What NAIA schools are is that they're, they're still four-year institutions, okay? So some of some get NAI schools confused with junior colleges. That's not the case. They're still four-year schools. Um, 
but basically the NAIA just competes under their own governing body. Okay, the NCAA is the governing body that governs Division One, Two, and Three schools. The NAIA is the governing body that at NAIA schools. Okay, so there's still four-year institutions. If you're going to be walking around an NAIA athletic campus, and to look around, you would have no way to be able to tell that it's an NAIA school. You wouldn't be able to pick out an NAIA school just by looking at it um, from an NCAA school. Um, they're all four-year institutions. They all are similar. NAIA schools tend to be roughly around the same size and the same sort of feel as Division II. Um, but there's a lot of benefits in terms of athletics that some of you may have already noticed under the scholarship section. Um, you know, recruiting regulations academically tend to be a little bit more lax at NAIA schools. So if you're struggling academically, bring your grades up. I mean, you need to buckle down in the classroom to be able to be a recruited athlete. But we may want to look the NAIA route as opposed to NCAA 1, 2, or 3 route. Um, NAIA schools sometimes tend to have a little, a little bit of a religious shift to them. Um, if, if religion is something that is important to you as a family, we may want to look at NAIA. There are still competitive programs in NAIA, and we find they're very similar to competitive Division II levels. Okay, so if, if we're thinking, oh, I'd like to go Division One or Two, depending on what I'm able to max out at, then you should also be considering NAIA programs too as well. Um, there's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's got the lowest amount of schools on both men's and women's side nationwide that offer NAIA programs at a collegiate soccer level. 196 men, 194 women, uh, women's programs. Okay, so you run into situations where opportunities in NAIA schools are not super prevalent, um, but they're out there. And, and if we can find them and establish ones that we're very interested in, these can be really good options. Scholarship-wise, men, I want you to take a look. And, uh, you know, those of you who are uh, going through this process for the sole purpose of generating scholarship to, a, to go to college, NAIA schools offer the most scholarship out of any sp other division level from a men's soccer perspective, more than Division One. If a program at an NAIA level is fully funded, scholarship is a main factor for you as a family going through this process, you've got to look the NAIA route. That's where the most money is going to be in terms of any scholarship that you're able to get athletically. Um, Full-ride scholarships are much more prevalent on a men's soccer side than even Division I programs from an NAIA level. Okay, NAIA can be a, a, an outlet for a lot of athletes, especially from a men's perspective and especially in terms of scholarship. Um, women's side still offering a lot here, not as much as Division I, um, because those are, are more funded at a Division I level, but nonetheless, you know, still a heavy contingency of, of athletic scholarship available in both men's and women's. Again, the competition here and the size and the scope and the types of schools are all very similar to Division II programs. Tryouts are also allowed at NAIA programs, very similar to that of D2 that I just talked about. Okay, so that's also a benefit to potentially targeting an NAIA school. Um, there's really no designated signing date, um, so there's nothing like where you would make a verbal commitment and sign a national letter of intent. There's no date when you would do that. Um, so the process tends to be just a little bit less formalized as a whole. Um, again, these are still prevalent in very specific regions, mostly in the central region. The NA headquarters is like in Kansas City or St. Louis. I, I can't remember which city specifically, but they're most prevalent in like, like Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, um, you know, types of states, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas. So in the event you're, a, you're an athlete up in Northeast, for example, that is looking at scholarship as being an important factor for you athletically to attend college, you know, you need to be open to ultimately maybe relocating to the central region of the United States. Um, NAIA schools do tend to be very prevalent when it comes to international athletes as well. So if we have any international kids in this class, because they offer the most scholarship athletically out of any of the programs from the men's side and a lot on the women's, they tend to look heavily into international athletes who can't qualify for domestic financial aid to recruit and bring on because they can just, you know, they can offset the, the expensive cost of college and, 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 you know, here in the United States. So we're going to fit there. The programs, 
bring a lot of benefit in themselves. And I know the one thing that a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't want to go Division three because they don't offer athletic scholarship. You're you're right. I mean, they, they certainly don't. They're certainly not put under the NCAA rules and regulations. But look at the amount of teams and look at the amount of programs that compete at a Division three level. 411 on the men's side. That's almost double. It's really right almost exactly double what the next highest division level is from a men's soccer perspective, which is Division Two. Okay, 37 women's programs, which is again almost um, almost 75 more programs that offer Division Three women's soccer than the next closest, which is Division One, from the women's side. Um, just just as a factor of how numbers work, guys, a majority of you who are sitting in on this recruiting class right now. The majority of kids who are in this class, maybe 75% of the kids that are in this class right now, are going to end up going to Vin 3. Okay, it's just how numbers work. They still need to fill rosters. They still need to recruit players. Okay, it makes the process less formal at a Division three level, considering there's no athletic money involved. These timelines are a little bit delayed here. Um, you know, oftentimes... You, you can really participate in ID camp at a Division three level, and, and if a coach, you know, likes how you play at an ID camp, you know, then, then they may very well extend you what they call a roster opening then, which is a guaranteed spot on their squad starting in the fall. Okay, so, so processes are less formal. You know, there, there's not as much funny there. You do still have the ability to generate financial aid at a Division three program. Um, you know, I would say when I'm working with athletes and working through the decision-making process of accepting an offer with them, it's about 50-50, in all honesty, guys, um, on, like, let's say if a, if a person is evaluating in three school or has a roster opening offer from a Division three program and also has an athletic scholarship uh, and academic scholarship offer from a Division two school, um, depending on, on how leads are, it's about 50-50 on what program still being more expensive than the other. Even though Division II is offering athletic and academic scholarship and Division Three is only offering um, financial aid from an academic perspective, a lot of times that financial aid from an academic perspective outweighs the combination of athletic and academic scholarship at a Division II school. Um, you have to have good grades for that to happen, so we need to buckle down in the classroom. And again, with the parity in college soccer on both the men's and women's side, um, there are competitive Division Three programs out there. Um, you know, the, the, the defending Division Three national championships could probably stack up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe, toe -to -toe with any mid-major Division One program, and it would probably be a 1-1, one, one, one nothing 2-1 type game. Okay, so there's still competitive soccer played at Division III. Um, these are oftentimes more private, smaller institutions, which oftentimes leads them to be more highly academic. So if academics is priority number one for you and you want to get into a highly academic school, we may want to look Division Three over the large, public, less formal Division I programs. Okay, even though we want to play soccer in college, the balance between athletics and academics at Division Three is much easier to handle than at Division One, but definitely, and and then at Division Two and probably at NAI, NAIA as well. Um, if you find that you struggle maybe to balance or budget your time between studies and athletics, Division Three may be for you. For example, a Division One program, they basically own you. I mean, you you are. You know, I played at a Division One level. I talked to you about that. Um, if I was going on away trips, the Division One coaches and the Division One staff wouldn't even let me pack my underwear. They had to pack my bag for me. All right, like they, I mean, they own you. Okay, so the Division Three, the level, and depending on how competitive the program is, than necessarily train formally throughout the entire spring season. So allows you a lot of times to focus on your studies. So. Um, keep that in mind for some families who are in that sort of situation. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to sell any of these levels on any of you. I just want to make sure that you guys are fully aware that, that there are pros and cons to every division level. Okay? Um, since there's no athletic money involved, you, you know, you, there's no formal need to sign like a national letter of intent or a document um, locking in your offer just because it's, 
you know, there, there's no athletic money attached to it. So you can still sign like a formal commitment letter if you'd like to have sort of a signing day at your high school, which I know a lot of people like to do, you know, they'll. Well, provide you a document to be able to do that. Um, half of Division Three is located in the Northeast. Okay, from both a men's and women's perspective, like 200 schools are located up in the Northeast Division Three from uh, from the men's side. Meaning that if you're in the Northeast, again, highly academic, considering highly academic schools, maybe smaller, more private schools, and that's what interests you. Smaller class sizes, more intimate settings. Then um, Division Three may be the area that you guys look. Um, junior college, um, these are your two-year institutions. Um, junior college can be utilized for a couple of different reasons. Um, some may think just if you're academically ineligible, you go junior college, and that's the only reason anyone would go junior college. Not the case. Um, if you get started in this process late, in junior college is a good way for you to just buy yourself time, play at a competitive junior college level, and if you're a Division One or, or, or highly competitive Division Two or um, highly competitive Division Three caliber type player, but you just get a late jump on recruiting, you can go to a, a junior college for a year, a coach or a school that has a lot of relationships with four-year institution coaches, and you transfer out from a junior college to a four-year institution later on down the line. Um, you know, that's something that a lot of people do as as a whole. Um, these are much cheaper options for the first two years. So families who struggle financially, um, you may very well be in a situation where you want to try to go to a junior college for two years, pay probably um, pennies on the dollar for what you would pay at a four-year college for two years, transfer out to a four-year institution, experience playing at sort of both levels, and you're saving cost in the long run. So those those are all ways in which student athletes would really attend a junior college or choose to attend a junior college or be academically ineligible to compete at a four year and need to ultimately uh, go to a junior college as a whole. Trials here are very common. Um, you know, depending on the, the type of junior college program, you probably just email the coach, set up a chance to go out and train with them. and. Um, you know, they'll let you know if you made it or if you didn't make it. Um, so the process is very informal at a junior college level, but still very competitive options. Um, you know, we're getting a little bit late into this discussion, um, but just a, a short story. Um, I talked to you guys. I, I played at the competitive Division One level. We were a top 25 program for you know, a couple of years, um, competing for a conference championship. Um, when, when we were there, we would compete against um, Cincinnati Community College um, or Cincinnati Junior College. Um, when, I went, when I attended Wright State in the off-seasons and in the summers and, and, and just as training and scrimmages, um, now granted this was a junior college program that competes for national championships every year. Um, we played them, I think, times throughout my career there, and I think we – you know, beat them twice, and they tied us once, and they were always 2-1, again, 1-1 one, one type games like that. So, again, you can still find competitive options at junior college, and, you know, if that doesn't um, indicate parity in college soccer as a whole, then I don't know what would, <laughs> all right? Um, We'll go on the timeline because I know this is a this is an important sticking point for a lot of families. You guys need to conceptualize the fact that recruiting is a process. It's a process from point A to point Z. You can be doing things that can help give you a leg up on your competent at any point in the timeline. Okay, but the but the primary timeline in which college coaches will a begin to put together a list of program a list of kids that they want to recruit and potentially extend offers to towards the end when they formally sign their last member of whatever class they're recruiting is indicated by these brackets here so women's soccer again i mentioned they would start putting together their list of recruits beginning freshman year um and 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 they would end right around um spring um, or early summer of junior years when they would finalize their offer to their last um, individual. All of these girls were probably verbally committed at a Division One level, probably summer going into their junior season, like I mentioned before. Okay, and then and out potentially any walk-on opportunities and finish out 
the formal process of actually signing your national letter of intent. Now, again, with the, the way that these players or the way that these Division I coaches were able to get these verbal offers from these women um, earlier on in their career as underclassmen is because most of them were taking unofficial visits, meeting with the coaches face-to-face on campus, which was permitted under the prior rules and regulations. The coaches were just extending a verbal offer, and women were accepting, and then they were signing a national letter of intent later on. Um, um, considering that the, the NCAA has eliminated that, opportunity. Again, we are unsure as to how that is going to affect the recruiting timeline from the women's perspective. So this may move, this may change. We need a larger sample size in terms of just um, this happening over the course of, uh, of, of some months or maybe a year before we really can see what is, is going to happen with the Division One women's recruiting timeline. Um, Division two and NAIA, as I mentioned before, are very similar. That reflects under their recruiting timelines on the women's side, right? You know, they, they tend to recruit within the same time frame. Um, summer going into your junior year is when the Division two contact period begins. So, for example, in three days, June 15th, Division two college coaches on both the men's and women's side are going to be able to actually start responding to some of those uh, emails that you're sending them. Them and talk to you in more of a recruiting sense um, organically. Um, now, Division Two, they started to put together those lists of girls that they would ultimately start communicating with um, next summer, starting spring club season of sophomore year. All right, and then finalizing out that recruitment by signing that national letter of intent um, winter of senior year. Um, same NAIA, I mean, it's roughly on the same timeline there. Division three, as I mentioned, is a little bit less delayed and a little bit less formal. Um, they are putting together potential prospects in the winter of junior year, evaluating them in person during the spring, um, talking to them, communicating them with them, bringing them out on visits in the fall, finalizing offers um, in the, in the uh, spring of, of senior season. Timeline is a little bit less is is a little bit more delayed. It's 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 again from the Division One perspective, it's not necessarily as competitive, and it hadn't been, um, which is why when I talk about the new NCAA rules and regulations that were put in place, I'm more so referring to it actually physically changing the women's timeline as opposed to men's timeline. Um, the men have always been, you know, falling under really roughly the, the same type of timeline. Um, you know, they, they, you know, men players tend to tend to mature slower. I mean, they t- it, it's tend to be more difficult to figure out what, what type of player you're gonna get early on in their high school career or, high, or early on in their club and youth career um, than from a women's perspective. So, college Division One programs from the men's side will start putting together lists of potential recruits that they want to start communicating with at the contact period um, beginning. By watch video, really, in fall of sophomore year, they will then scout them in person during spring club season of sophomore year. That timeline starts in the fall of junior year. They will communicate and build a relationship with that player throughout all of junior year. They will extend a verbal offer, and those players will make a verbal commitment during the summer and fall, summer of, of junior year going into senior year and fall of senior year, and then sign that national letter of intent mid-senior year. Um, Division two. They'll start putting together that list of players mostly during camps, summer going into junior year, and then um, ultimately that contact period begins, start evaluating them throughout all of junior year, verbal commitments again then coming summer, fall you know, of the latter half of their junior year and early portion of their senior year, finalizing in the winter. All right, Division Three and the NAI timelines are almost exactly the same. Um, you know, the stretch into the spring of senior year, so we still have 2018 programs looking for 2018 players out of the NAIA uh, Division Three, and, and obviously the junior college route. So I want you to look at this timeline and really figure out ultimately where you're at in this process. If you find yourself in the latter halves of the timeline, um, 
you know, it doesn't mean we need to be in panic mode yet, but we certainly need to start doing something. If you find yourself as being a 2022 graduate or a 2021 graduate and not even to the beginning of this timeline yet, there's still things that you can be doing to prepare and give yourself a leg up, researching schools, putting together highlight tape, sending out emails with highlight tape to get on a coach's radar, which you're still permitted to do, attending camps, touring campuses, at least figuring out sort of um, what types of colleges entice you so you can be best prepared as you approach the latter period. It's, okay. Um, just some additional aspects to, to remember and to think about with the recruiting timeline. Not all schools are going to fall within these timelines. Timelines, okay. I don't want you getting in a position where you're communicating with a college coach and they say, hey, yeah, we want to extend you a verbal offer and, and have you guys respond and say, oh, well, you know, Coach Angelo at NCSA told me that the recruiting timeline and the offer period for Division One doesn't happen at XYZ period, right? Everyone's going to recruit at their own pace. Okay, this is just a general consensus and an overall sort of macro perspective of what is going on in recruiting at any time from an overall sort of perspective. But, for example, on that second bullet point, higher academic institutions may, re may recruit later if they're Division I. For example, Harvard, like was an Ivy League school that competes in Division I athletics, um, they need to know what the full extent of your academic history is at a high school level to establish that you're going to be accepted into Harvard, which is going to predicate, you know, whether or not they, they extend you an offer or not. So they're probably not going to start evaluating or communicating with players until the second half of junior year at the earliest. Um, you know, they need to see what a full sort of academic slate looks like. And that is the same across the board with just coaches that have different preferences on when they start recruiting and what tournaments they attend. So I don't want you to think this is the, the, the exact timeline for every program, but it's the general consensus. Um, Walk-on spots are a talking point that a lot of people need education on. Um, a walk on opportunity in, in collegiate soccer, you're still a recruited player. I don't want you guys going into this process assuming that, oh, if I don't get an offer to a Division One school, I'm still just going to go ahead and attend that Division One program, and then I'll just go ahead and attend a walk on trout in the fall and see if I make the team. Um, there is not a guarantee that that coach or that program is even going to hold walk on tryouts in the fall. Um, for example, we didn't. I never, I never participated in, or I never saw any of our coaches hold a single walk on tryout at Wright State when I attended college, okay, when I played soccer. Um, some schools just don't offer them in general. And then the ones that do are most likely going to make those walk on tryouts by invitation only. They're going to be players maybe that they recruit, that they like that they didn't have the funding to extend an athletic scholarship to, that just ultimately end up having to um, on as potential walk-on players in the fall where the coach will give them an opportunity to play their way onto the team. Okay, so you need, if you're approaching, you know, a, a, a place where you feel that you would like to maybe assess walk-on opportunities, you need to be confirming these with the school. We're just assuming. Um, you know, questions to be asking coaches when you're building communication. Oftentimes I get, you know, athletes coming to me asking, well, what questions should I ask this coach? I just can't think of questions. Um, one question that you can always ask a coach that they're going to be certainly um, receptive to answering for you is what is your recruiting timeline? And it's going to help you out as a family know how to target that specific school, when to approach that specific school with certain concepts and, and questions. Um, you can ask when they start making offers. Do you already have people that, you, that have extended offers to your school? Um, I just to a family today who um, is targeting a Division I college from the men's side and um, you know felt like they were being recruited by this school. I went back and looked, and there were five people who are already committed out of this individual's recruiting class. They were done recruiting, um, but the family was under the impression that they were still being recruited by that particular college. So you guys should always know what their timeline is and what a college coach's intentions are, and these are questions that you can use to ask um, at any point, um, just to clarify. Um, 
Now, ev- now, getting evaluated by college co- – I mean, every player is ultimately going to need to play in front of a college coach before they get an offer, okay? N- rarely are coaches going to ultimately extend offers to players just by watching video, okay? But video is how we grab a coach's attention, and then they're probably going to need to see you play two, three, four, maybe five different times in some cases. So if you ever ask yourself, what do I need to be doing right now – Oftentimes, we want you to be in front of a coach, a majority of the time, okay? But there's only certain periods in time in which it's going to be easy for you to play in front of a coach. Um, if a winter months, college coaches are going to be much more receptive to ultimately reviewing video, okay? You need to be sending emails in the winter, regardless of where you're at in the timeline, and start making connections with coaches through highlight tape, giving them a little bit of a an appetizer to the main course of inviting them to watch you play in person. Um, you'll be playing tournaments, club tournaments and showcases in the spring most of the time. Um, camps are going to be going on in the summer, so you should probably be doing camps in the summer. The fall is a down period. High school soccer is essentially irrelevant when it comes to collegiate recruiting. Um, college coaches are in season. They're not going to pay attention to players at a high school level. So we can be either focusing on skill development in the fall or you can be focusing on taking visits in the fall. Those are all good ideas. Um, again, from the current regulations, there's no restrictions on you reaching out to coaches. The more you reach out to coaches, the more success you'll have, the more you'll be on the radar, the more name recognition you'll develop. Um, you know, again, the contact periods we already discussed, June 15th before junior year. Um, so three days, Division Two programs will be able to start communicating with um, 2020 graduates. Um, September 1st before your your junior year, so in a couple months, Division One programs will ne- will then begin to actually com- be able to communicate with um, current 2021 graduates as well. Um, reach out, and if if I'm going to give you guys any advice, um, and 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 the thing that we tell you guys as athletes the most you need to do is email coaches, call coaches, depending on where you're at in the timeline. The biggest thing that these student athletes neglect to do as members of NCSA and maybe what they end up not reaching their goals because of is reaching out to college coaches. Right? So everybody knows that it's something that needs to be done. Um, you need to make sure that you do it. Okay? You can't just think about it and, and, and expect recruiting to happen organically. We need to be reaching out to coaches. We need to be intelligent about how we communicate. Um, we need to be practicing on how we communicate. And ultimately, we have recruiting classes and drills within your profile associated with um, coachcation and how we communicate and what questions we ask. You can find more information out about um, NCSA University and rookie orientation, that class. Um, Camps and clinics are questions we get all the time. Um, Oftentimes in collegiate soccer, they're a good way to ultimately advance yourself in the recruiting process, but they're oftentimes a bad way for you to get noticed. Okay, so my recommendation is always, as an underclassman, freshman, sophomore, pick maybe five schools that you think are realistic options and that you're most interested in and be a frequenter at those camps every summer. Um, Later on in the process, when we start emailing schools and calling coaches, any coaches that end up showing some level of interest in your highlight tape or end up recruiting you, you may want to go to those camps then to advance your recruitment. We're probably past the point where we will actually be able to get noticed by coaches, and that's from a men's and women's perspective. So um, these what camps you attend off researching schools in depth and knowing what your goals are. Um, you'll be able to help you narrow down what camps to ultimately attend in the summers. I've gone way over here, guys. Um, so ultimately, where we need to go from here is just complete your profile as much as you can. Um, all too often, we find profiles that are just half filled out. They don't have their club history back as far as they need to go. Um, they're not selling themselves properly. So if you're new to NDSA, complete your profile, fill out all the information that you can. Um, if you're an NCSA and, and continuing to work on video, get us video as soon as you can. If you have video posted, you're, you're 12 times more likely to, to receive coach views, eight times more likely to receive coach follows. 
sign up for coach communication classes. Um, if you're looking at attending camps this summer, um, we ultimately have soccer camp and tournament prep classes associated with your CSA profile within NCSA University, soccer camps and clinics is something you can find in NCSA University under recruiting classes and our, um, and our um, library, our video library. Um, for international student athletes in on this class, we have an international class devoted to what you should be doing, you know, as an underclassman or at any given time, um, since the process is going to be a little bit different for you. Um, so I know it's late. Um, that's all we had here today. Um, yeah, for, for those of you who are reviewing the recording, you know, I appreciate you putting up with me the whole time. I, I told you at the beginning of the session, I am a chatterbox. I want to make sure things are clear. I want to make sure things are well explained. That's just my attitude, and that's just how I am. So I, I certainly do apologize if it's late for some of you on the East Coast. Um, but unless I am going to leave it open to questions right now. If you have any questions, type it in the chat box on the bottom right. Um, I'll be here as long as we need to field any questions that we have. Um, if, you're, if you're leaving us, um, review the recording later date to maybe hear some of the answers to these questions. But nonetheless, I'm glad you guys sat in here today, uh, and I wish you the best of evenings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab some water and, and let you guys kind of type away in the, in the chat box if you have any questions at all. I'll be happy to field any of them. All right? All right, so we got a couple questions coming through here. Um, question from, uh, I'm not sure who the name is there, um, but they asked, when invited to a camp, is it a good idea to approach a coach and let him know who you are and talk to him before the sessions? Um, good question. Certainly as a junior and as a just going into your senior year, yes, I would highly recommend it. Um, you should always be sending out emails and any highlight tape you have to coaches before attending camps. But remember, with the new NCAA rules and regulations, if you're a freshman or a sophomore, you're, not, you're no longer permitted to talk to a college coach in a recruiting sense, which means, hi, Ms. I'm interested in getting recruited by your school. You know, thank you for having me at your camp. Um, you're not allowed to go that far in terms of your communication. So you should still send emails and you should still send video and let them know that you're interested in their school and that you're going to the camp um, as a way to get evaluated by their staff. But ultimately, um, you physically communicate with them at the camp. If you're an upperclassman and past the contact period, um, I would certainly suggest that you engage them as much as you can. Uh, Matthew asks, realistically, would a division for an NAIA team prepare you as a soccer player to be able to play semi-pro or professionally? Um, long answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, there is a slew of NAIA players who end up going to USL, um, semi-professional soccer. Um, it's probably going to be more difficult for you as a Division II or an NAIA player to get recruited to play to go to the MLS, um, but ultimately it's going to be predicated on how much you perform, right? You're probably going to be much more likely if you go to a Division II school and you're an All-American Division II player and you're a Conference Player of the Year and you're up near the top of the rankings in terms of goals scored at a Division II player. Um, to go professionally or to get drafted in the MLS than if you went to a Division One program and sat the bench for three years and were a role player your senior year. Okay? Um, it has happened. It's happened numerous times over the course of the past couple of years where Division Two, even Division Three players are recruited or, or not recruited, are drafted to play professionally. NAIA p programs, because there's a large international contingent that go to those schools, oftentimes very regularly play semi-professionally at, at the USL level. And if you guys keep up with professional soccer in the U.S., FC Cincinnati is an example of a USL program, semi-pro program, 
okay, that just basically got enough funding that they are now going to be advanced into an MLS professional program next year. So all the players that were ultimately on FC Cincinnati that came from various colleges across the country at various division levels are now going to be MLS players. Okay, because they advance through the ranks. So um, certainly it is very realistic that it would happen. Um, but ultimately, long story short, you, it's, it's not just predicated on what division level you play in order to get drafted to play professionally. Um, it depends on how well you perform when you get there. So make sure you perform wherever you go. Um, Mu asked as well. Um, do more division players ever transfer to higher division levels throughout their college careers? Um, it happens. It is very rare in collegiate soccer. Um, think about it in terms of a college coach. If you're a Division One college coach, why would you recruit a player who was recruited to go to a Division Three school? Um, if if you develop, if you're under the mindset that, oh, I'll just go to a, a Division II program and develop for a year and then transfer to a Division I program, if you developed that much as an 18- or 19-year-old kid at after one year of collegiate soccer, then every single individual who goes Division II would transfer to a Division I school, Okay. And every Division One program would recruit only transfer athletes from Division Two, right? So um, it's unrealistic that it would happen. It has happened. It does happen. If you want it to happen, you need to be proactive. Um, and you ultimately need to get released by the current college that you're with, meaning that if you attend a Division Two program or any program for the matter, and you want to transfer, um, you need to get released by your own college coach, which may or may not grant you that release, which means you're then stuck in a situation where the coach is now mad at you because you already told you wanted to transfer, or if they grant you that release and you are just lay your struggle to ultimately connect with coaches at higher division levels, which is much harder to do, now you're stuck in a situation where you're not playing college soccer at all. So... I would be very cautious of going into a college situation already under the impression that you're going to transfer. Um, it does happen. It's very rare, though, for you to bump up in a division level, just considering that's what everyone would want to do. Um, uh, another question here, what are the chances of being spotted or invited to tryouts as a senior when you're new on NCSA? Um, um, you, you would need to be proactive and request those. I mean, you could certainly have a college coach that's searching through the network, sees some video that they like, sees that you're a regional kid, sees that your academics are in line with what the school can provide, and basically extend you an invitation to come try out with them um, in the fall to addition to or an NAIA program. Um, there's, a, there's a strong opportunity that a coach may have seen you at a, a spring club game and invited you out to try out maybe then with their team to a Division II or, or an NAIA school. Um, but um, and, and that's very likely that that would happen. Um, but you're going to increase your chances, if that's the question that you're asking, you know, what are the chances of being spotted? You'll increase your chances tenfold if you're proactive. If we email schools, if we do the right research and find the right fits that are realistic for us, um, our video is good, markets us properly, we reach out to that coach and ask them if they can give you some feedback on your highlight tape and you'd like to request to see what the chances of you being able to attend an open tryout um, or train with the team in the in, in the fall as, as an upperclassman, as a junior and senior. So um, it's very likely, and the chances are high, and they even are higher in the event um, that you act more proactively. Hmm. Looks like the questions I had here for now, um, we'll do last call for these. If you have any remaining questions, don't hesitate to ask. I mean, you're not you're not in, in, inconvenienced me at all. Feel free to throw them in the chat box. I'd be happy to to address anything. I think we still have uh, you know a couple people still in the chat here. So guys, college coaches send recruitment teams 
watch high school fall seasons. Um, no, no, highly unlikely. It's not going to happen. We need to play club. Um, College coaches are in season in the fall. Um, they are focusing on winning games and not getting fired. They are focused on traveling. They are focused on training. They literally just don't have the time to come to high school programs to scout players. And oftentimes, uh, 99% of the time, the high school teams are less competitive than club teams, so it wouldn't do them much good. So um, short answer to that, um, I wouldn't bank on it. I'm going to cut it off there. Um, I've talked your ears off enough. Um, thank you for joining the chat. Um, I apologize again if you're on the East Coast and um, you are uh, late, hopefully on summer vacation. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to send out this recording to everybody. So if you have any questions, call our member support team uh, at 877-845-6276 or connect with your head recruiting coach based on your membership. Um, one last question, living in New England, what, what division is best to look at? Probably Division Three, just because there's more Division Three programs in the Northeast um, than any other levels. But it's going to depend on your highlight tape and, and what your ability is. Um, nonetheless, guys, have a good evening. Um, welcome to NCSA in the event that you're new uh, members to NCSA. And uh, I look forward to maybe working with some of you that are, uh, that, that are assigned to me. Have a good one, guys.